It really is hard to rise up and lay really low. It's an interesting little phenomenon because we want to be noteworthy socially, but anonymous spiritually. But the time has come for us to be able to not only live the gospel, but to be able to share the gospel. We are here on the planet, on the globe, to share the gospel of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know, I'll just tell you a little bit of trivia. I have never used an emoji, not one time, not one time. Do you want to know why? Because I am an emoji. I feel like it's too much. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's too much for someone like me to use an emoji because I am a living emoji. I am one. I am one. And I, I know that I am. Is your Bible open? Okay, the gospel of what? And I need you in chapter 8. Go with me to chapter 8 of the gospel of Luke. Now, you are holding in your hands something that is not like any other book. Is anybody listening to me tonight? What you have opened before you is not like any other book. This is the word of God. This is the word of God right there on the page. Just waiting to jump off of that sacred page right into the marrow of your bones. Is your word not like a fire, the prophet Jeremiah said. You need some fire in your bones this weekend. This is how to get it. There's nothing, nothing, nothing like the word of God. Nothing like the word of God. And we are gonna see what he will say to us out of these scriptures. Tonight, I'm going to land with you in Luke chapter 8. I'm going to start reading at verse 40 in just a moment. But let me tell you a little bit about where we are going. We are going to look at three different places in Scripture where Jesus causes women to actually rise. We're going to look at she rising right there on the page because she rises whom Jesus raises. I, I want to say that one more time. She rises whom Jesus raises. Because here we are this weekend to rise up. But there's one way we're going to rise up and stay up. And that is to be raised by Jesus Christ himself. You want me to throw this off, Amy, or you just keep it on? I want to show you a couple of things that we're going to have in the passages before us. And we're going to go to three different scenes. We're going to have composites, scenes where Jesus is going to encounter a woman that he is going to bring to her feet. It starts right here in Luke chapter 8. And here's what I want you to be looking for. I want you to think in terms of prognosis and diagnosis. Because in all three of these scenes, we're going to see a diagnosis. I'm going to give them a little bit of verbiage because we're going to see three different ones. We're going to see somebody that was defiled, somebody that was dead, and somebody that was devastated. I wonder if anybody in the room knows what it's like to just feel defiled. I had a friend in the faith that used to love to use that word. And, and I used to think, what, why is it? She was just talking about the defiled and the, and the pure. And I thought, you know, it, it just made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Because I knew that with my background, I came from the defiled category. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I have no memory whatsoever of innocence, none whatsoever. I was sexually abused at such a young age, I have no memory of any sense of innocence or purity. And then as if that were not enough, I went on to make the world's most foolish decisions. I wonder if anybody in the house can relate to what I'm saying. Defiled. Then there's just plain dead. And then there's devastated. Diagnoses. Interesting word. The gnosis on the end of it means knowledge. The D-I-A on the front of it means to identify or to distinguish symptoms. 
And, and I have a feeling that the way God is going to work among us this weekend is that he is going to give us some idea, some insight into a diagnosis for us. What is troubling you? Anybody ever needed it to be identified? Anybody get that with me? Anybody thought to yourself recently, what in the world is the matter with you? Whether you've just had like a heaviness in your spirit or you just feel anxious, you've been grouchy for 35 years. <laughs> Whatever it may be, has anybody ever been like me? I can remember that I would cry in my pillow, Holly. I would cry in my pillow and I would ask the Lord, why do I do what I do? I remember one time looking in the mirror through a particularly terrible season of my life, very uncharacteristic season of my life, staring in the mirror and saying, who are you and what are you doing? What are you doing? Every now and then, we need a savior that can look in under the sin to the need. Anybody know what I'm talking about? They can look in under the fruit to the root. What is this growing out of diagnosis? But here's the beautiful part of it. For every single one of us, we have a prognosis. You see, Holly, this may be my very favorite name of an event ever. And I've been speaking at women's events for 30 something years, and I have never heard a better title, never in my life, than She Rises. Never, never. Because of this, I promise you, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter what your diagnosis may be this weekend, I can tell you your scriptural prognosis in Christ this is what he's looking for. This is what he's out for. Prognosis is that same word gnosis, that's knowledge. The P-R-O means it's literally foreknowledge, to know before. And it's, uh, in the dictionary, it is defined as the prospect of recovery as anticipated. The progress and the prospect of recovery. This I know he has spoken over every single one of us in this room who will. You see that woman right there? She rises. If you are in Christ, he can point to you and say, she rises and she rises. And I mean, who's in Christ here tonight? Well, then she rises too. That woman right there, somebody beside you, she rises, she rises. Because if you are in Jesus Christ, Girlfriend, you're rising. You're rising sooner or later, and it may as well be this weekend. See, here's what I want to tell you before we start reading together. There is, in God's economy, a reversal of gravity. Anybody understand what I'm saying? A reversal of gravity. In God's economy, the way up is down. Those who humble themselves are lifted up, and those who fall at Jesus' feet get placed back on their own. I promise you this weekend, on the authority of the Word of God, that if you fall at His feet this weekend, in whatever posture that looks like for you, whether it is in worship, through the, uh, through the posture of your heart and soul before him, or if you get back home or back to your hotel room tonight, whatever, however, whenever you can do it, when we go low before the Lord and humble ourselves before him in the mighty and miraculous name of Jesus, we are coming up. All it takes this weekend, if you're looking, if you're thinking, I want to be one of those who are, all it takes... Bow down, bow down. 
Because let me tell you something, when you bow down, what it allows God to do is when we bow down under his mighty arm, and it says he will pick us up in due time, when we submit ourselves and bow down, he said, let me tell you something, I'm about to handle this situation, and my arm is about to swing, and I suggest you bow down so it does not hit you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm going to handle it. I'm going to handle it. You don't have to have a lot of offense on your spirit. You don't have to have a lot of unforgiveness. Don't worry about any of that. You don't have to get back at them. You don't have to get back at them. You just bow down. Submit yourself before the Lord, and He is going to pick you up. The way to rise is to fall. Pride falls. Humility rises. That is reversal of gravity in God's economy, Luke chapter 8 and verse 40. Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. And Jesus went, and the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Don't miss the two sets of 12. And though she had spent all of her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who is it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and you, and pressing in on you and, and you ask who touched you? Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him and declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Would you just look at this scene with me? Because here we have someone on the page pressed into a crowd while Jesus is on his way somewhere else to somebody's greater need. It's the strangest positioning on the page in your Bibles and mine. Because the story of the girl that is dying is wrapped around this one group of passages right in the middle of this woman so desperate for healing in the crowd, she presses through it until she can grab the hem of Jesus' garment. If she could just press in and just somehow touch even what he's wearing She knows that she will be healed. Somebody took a look around tonight at this crowd, and really all you could do is maybe hope some word would come to you, something would happen, that God might have something for you in the mix, lost in the crowd but you might never have dreamed in your life that actually he came for you. He came for you. I want you to know something about the woman because it says that she realized that she could not go unnoticed in verse 47. Verse 47, when it says, and when the woman saw that she was not hidden, I want you to know this weekend, wherever you sit in this room, you are not hidden from Christ. You are not just one in the crowd. You really do get to press in and grab on. I I love that it describes the prayer shawl he has on and all the way back into the Old Testament when it described what the Hebrew men, the devout Hebrew men would wear. It talked about these tassels on their garment. And I just love that he's pressing through the crowd and that she grabs on to the edge of it because he makes himself reachable, and not just reachable, touchable. You know something else I just love about Jesus? Do you know this is one thing that has kept me in this book for nearly 40 solid years? 
I'm going to tell you something. I have a man back in Houston, Texas that I love so much. We have ridden such a roller coaster together. We have been through it in ways I cannot even describe to you. God has been so faithful to us. I love that man so much. There is nobody, nobody like Keith Moore on the planet. But I'm going to tell you something that my husband knows. And it's okay with him because this is what has saved our marriage in a thousand different ways, and he would want it no other way. The absolute romance of my life has been with Jesus Christ since I have been this big. I do not know what it is about him. Somehow the beautiful balance of security and mystery. I just cannot get enough of it. And right here is something completely unexplainable that Jesus, the Christ, who could read hearts and minds and does it all over the Gospels, the one who spoke the worlds into orbit says, who touched me? I felt the power go out for me. See, you're wondering this weekend if you will get affected by Jesus, but I wonder if you know that when you are affected by him. He is affected by you. Could you reach your mind around that truth tonight that you are important enough to him? That when you are altered by him, he feels it as well. That he knows you're here. And listen, somebody is just hoping. I mean, you've been praying and praying and praying toward this weekend, thinking, I, I just, if, if God, I just want, I just need a touch. I just need a touch. I just, I, I desperately need a touch. I, I pray, you've asked your friends, pray for me, pray for me, that I might get a touch from God. But what, what, what you need to know is that you don't have to sit back and hope he touches you. Why don't you just like reach out and grab? Reach out and grab. He, he's made himself grabbable. Does anybody want to know that this weekend? That you, listen, it says in Isaiah chapter 6 that the train of his robe fills the temple. That, that's, that is a really, really wide hymn. <laughs> there is enough him on his robe for all of us to grab. You got your own place. How much do you want him this weekend? I mean, are you just going to sit back and hope? Just hope you have an encounter with him? Or would you like to just show him a little bit of faith that would make him smile and go, listen, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to press through this crowd. This crowd is not going to get between me and Jesus. Somebody here is thinking this crowd is going to get, no, no, no. I, I'm wondering, does anybody have an attitude that says this crowd is not big enough to keep me from Jesus? This crowd is not fierce enough to keep me from Jesus. Nothing is going to keep me from Jesus. See, here's the thing. What she had was embarrassing. I mean, nobody goes like, my favorite passage in the Word of God is about the discharge of blood. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if in heaven she'll be anonymous. You know, we're going to meet all these other people, but like she just like saying... <laughs> we go, what's your story? Oh... It's not all that dramatic. <laughs> and here she is. Because see, the, the little girl, she had something taking her life, but this, this woman right here, she just had something ruining hers. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, because for most of us, our most debilitating area is very, very personal. And in fact, I, I would venture to guess that you came here with great care to hide what is bothering you most this weekend. Great care to hide. And I've got such good news for you because you need not hide it in this room. If you only knew, I don't know anyone who is not messed up. And I know a lot of people. I just don't, I just don't. Listen, if, they, if they're acting like they're not, they're probably lying. Everybody's got something. Everybody's got something. Somebody's got a really, 
really hard secret in the house. And you know the saying, we're all as sick as our secrets. It was manageable at first, but now it's turned into a hemorrhage. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. My grandson, Jackson, about a year ago, had a really deep scratch right down the inside of his leg. He's 10 now. He was nine at the time. And I, he had on a pair of shorts, and I was looking at it. It was an angry, angry scratch. I said, buddy, what happened to you? And so he explained to me that he, was, he had climbed a tree, and, and when he jumped out of it, a, a jagged part of a limb caught him right on the inside of his little thigh. And I mean, it just was as, as red as it could be. And I said, does it hurt? I said, boy, buddy, it looks like it hurts. He said, it doesn't hurt all that much, not if I pinch myself right here. <laughs> That's what some of us are doing. We're trying, just we keep pinching ourselves right here so we will take our minds of what's hurting us the most. People ask us what's wrong, and so we tell them about the thing that we're pinching right here because we don't want to tell them about the gash in the inside of our thigh because it's personal. It's a secret. I'm praying for Jesus to heal us this weekend from something that has harassed us for years for years, for years, when we tried everything else. I'm going to tell you something. Here's what we do. We keep looking to everybody else on the planet to fix it for us. And all they can do, we keep looking to a man to fix it for us. We keep looking for a friend to fix it for us. And all they can do is put scotch tape on a hemorrhage. That's all they're doing. We got a Savior that really can heal us, but we just keep going to people who are handing us a little piece of scotch tape, and we think that's going to stop our hemorrhaging. But it just never does, does it? I, I got to tell you something, and I, 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 I'm telling you the gospel truth. I get here this afternoon. I have no idea. I have thought and thought what it was doing in my purse. I had already written up my notes. I had already sent them to my assistant to take down to the lobby to, uh, to uh, print out. And I thought to myself, man, I wish I had some scotch tape that I'd be able to take with me and say, this is exactly what we're doing. I'd already written it in my notes. Taking scotch tape from people to cover Cover our hemorrhage. And so I was pulling stuff out of my purse to get to my lipstick a little later in the time that I was getting ready and there was scotch tape in my purse. I'm like, what, what in the world? <laughs> and that's what we're doing. We got a savior in the house this weekend. A savior. Do not look to anyone else a savior. And when he does something dramatic for you, if you will let him this weekend, do not credit a single human name with it. Do not even bring us up. If we would credit Jesus alone, there is no telling what he would do for us. But we keep tweeting people's names. There is one name, and that is the name of Jesus. There is one name, and that is the name of Jesus. There is no other name. There is no other name. Her condition meant that she was defiled. She had guts enough to even go in a crowd where she was not supposed to be. According to the Old Testament, early, early law in the book of Numbers, not only was she defiled over her hemorrhaging, everyone she touched, she defiled. Everyone she touched. But that's a thing about Jesus is that we cannot be unclean enough to get Jesus dirty. He just, there's just no way for you to dirty him up. I don't know anything else to tell you. But there's this gorgeous part in the scriptures. 
a reversal of what that portion in Numbers says. When it says in Exodus 29, 37, whoever touches the altar becomes holy. Just to touch him is holiness for us. And she admits to it. You know, this is us all right, isn't it? Because she's trying to slip through the crowd. That's what many of us are going to try to do this weekend. We've come in a big crowd. We're going to try to slip out in it. Say, man, we had a great weekend, but we don't want to be weird out in the rest of the world. But I'm going to tell you something. It's hard to rise up and still lay low is a thing. It really is hard to rise up and lay really low. It's an interesting little phenomenon because we want to be noteworthy socially, but anonymous spiritually. But the time has come for us to be able to not only live the gospel, but to be able to share the gospel. Somebody wrote me a, a letter a couple of days ago, and I get it, I get it. And, and somebody else is going to write me a letter about this very thing. This is not going to sit well with somebody. I get that, I get that. I'll handle it when I hear from you. But she simply said, don't you think it is enough to just love people? Yes, I do. And what would not be very loving is that we're going to spend all this time around them and we're never going to tell them the reason for the hope that is in us. We are here on the planet, on the globe, to share the gospel of the living Lord Jesus Christ. And we live it or it does not fly with them. But when the Holy Spirit opens the door, when we are given opportunity to say, I'm just going to tell you what happened to me, Jesus Christ saved my scrawny neck from hell. That is what happened to me. That is what happened to me. I was going to hell, and now I'm not going to hell. If that is not good news, that you are not going to hell, I don't know what kind of news you need. I don't know why we think it is terrible news to say, I am not going to hell. I'm happy I'm not going to hell. Is anybody else happy they're not going to hell? Okay, now watch what happens here. Okay, so verse 49, while he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this answer, remember the girl? Because she was the one that was dying, the 12-year-old. Jairus' daughter. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And, and they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, child. Arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. This is one of my very favorite parts. And he directed that something should be given to her to eat. Come on, somebody. I mean, <laughs> when I get raised from the dead, I want to eat. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to want to eat. I'm going to want to eat in the worst way. And it's, just, it's just a beautiful thing because we've got the defiled and then we've just got the stone cold dead. The girl is dead. The girl is dead. And he said, I just want you to watch this because I'm, I mean, all it's going to take is child, rise. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked when we were living in them. But now, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. That is some kind 
of good news. I love what one of the commentators said, that the girl is asked to do what a dead person cannot do. But the powerful word of Jesus enables what it demands. Okay, go here with me for just a moment. Because everybody in this room who's listening this weekend, who's really intent on hearing from the Lord, you're going to. You're going to get a word. You are going to get a word straight off the page of Scripture. And with that word comes the unction to obey it. Child, arise. Child, leave that life. Child, make that move. Child, stand up in the midst of the dead. Child, obey me and go to the mission field. Child, you'll get a word. You'll get a word. And with the word comes the unction to obey the word. Go with it. Go with it. Don't wait a month to obey As God speaks over you this weekend, respond then, respond then, because with his powerful word comes the unction and the power to obey. Does anybody know what I'm talking about in the house tonight? I learned something that I found so interesting. The name Jairus, that is her father's name back in verse 41. The name Jairus means he will awaken. He being in this context, that is God, will awaken. Do you realize that every time somebody said, hey, Jairus, they were prophesying over what would happen in his family, accidentally, of course. He'd been named by that hope. Watch this, buddy, because all I'm going to have to do is lean over her and say, Jairus. Everybody in this room has been dead. When Holly earlier prayed with us to receive Christ or to return to Him, somebody went from dead to alive in a split second, dead to alive. There's somebody, He is leaning over this weekend saying, child, Arise. Arise. If you do not know Jesus, you do not even yet know what it's like to be truly alive. He knows why he put you on the planet. He knows the plans he has for you. And I I love that verse out of Jeremiah because it reminds me again that what he's saying is this, you know, actually I'm the one with the plan. So, you know, if you're not looking to me, you actually don't know it. And he's so wise because he gives us just enough light to take the very next step. But he knows good and well that if he gave us the whole thing at once, we just go on, you know what? Save yourself the trouble, Lord. I've got this from here. (laughs) And off we go in the sin of our independence, and we just rename our rebellion, not wanting to bother God. But he says, I know it. I know how everything you have been through, every skill you have, every bit of your gifting, everything that comes together in your DNA that makes you you, I have got a way to use. Nothing will be wasted. Nothing. But I know the plans I have for you. And you do not, child, arise. Would you turn with me lastly to John chapter 11? Very familiar scene, perhaps for many of you. When Jesus' good friend Lazarus is extremely sick, and word comes to him, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. John chapter 11 and verse 4 says, when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness is not going to lead to death, for it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified. It tells us in in verse 5 that Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. 
Verse six, this is just it right here. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. He loved him so much, he just did not go. <laughs> Until two more days had passed. Looking at the time on his cell phone. <laughs> because I think that was a very long 48 hours because I think he was waiting very much on purpose to make sure that they knew the man was stone cold dead. Word reaches the house that he's coming toward them. Martha runs out. Where have you been? Where have you been? He tells her he's the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me says though he die, yet shall he live. It says that she runs back in to get her sister Mary, tells her in private the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And it says in verse 29, pick up with me there. And when she heard it, this is Mary, she rose quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Every one of these scenes, the woman with the issue of the blood falls at his feet. The child dead on the mat, devastated, Mary, weeping at his feet. Jesus sees her and he begins weeping, deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And so the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Verse 38, when Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb, it was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time, this is a perfect moment. I, I hope so much you have a King James Version sitting in front of you right now because it says, by this time he stinketh. <laughs> Perfection. Because Martha somehow has gotten in her head that if indeed he can raise Lazarus from the dead, there will be absolutely nothing he can do about the way the man smells. <laughs> and that for the rest of the man's life, he will smell just like that. <laughs> and see somebody here, you are so worried about what's gonna happen if you really give your life to Jesus because it is gonna cause one big stink. But if Jesus can raise you from the dead, are you telling me he cannot give you the glorious fragrance of Christ? So he says, verse 42, verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? I mean, in what world, Martha, does the glory of God stink? In what world? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. I love that he told them to unbind him. He could have. He told them to. 
Because you see, we have so much to do with the way one another are set free to live in their risenness by simply saying, we acknowledge you have been raised from the dead. You are not who you once were. We acknowledge that God has done something brand new in you. If we would acknowledge to one another the change that is before we've ever seen it, before we've ever seen it, by virtue of the fact that Jesus Christ has commanded it and made it so. Unbind them. Who have you not forgiven? Unbind them. Who is it that you have not yet believed has changed? Unbind them. Unbind them. That they may live out their resurrection with the dignity of Christ. I want to ask you to stand, please. I want you to see something with me as we close this portion. D did you catch the part that says in verse 41, so they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard. He lifted up his eyes. Now listen, there's no bad way to pray. No bad way to pray. But it's an interesting thing to me that when Jesus prayed, and there are several times there's a record of this in the Gospels, that when he prayed at times, he would look straight up. Can you imagine? I mean, could he look straight through the heavens? He didn't bow his head. And I'm all for bowing my head. But he just like lifted his up. And I thought maybe, maybe that's the first step to rising is that we lift our eyes up. We lift our eyes up. Some of you have lived so ashamed of yourself that you have not lifted your chin before God in years. We are all going to practice this tonight because we are not going to close our eyes in this ending prayer right here. We are going to look straight up with our chins up and we are going to say to him, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Can you just say those words? Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Now raise me. Say it again. I thank you that you have heard me. Raise me. Raise me. Now raise me. I want you to know something tonight. There is no one like our God. There is nothing like His Word. There is no limit to His power. There is no boundary to His love. There is no life beyond His reach. There is no sin beyond His cross. There is no dead that can't be raised because, girlfriend, there is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. We bless your name, Lord. We bless your name. We bless your name. Raise us, Lord. Raise us to our feet. Give us the courage to unbind one another and to be free in Jesus' name.